Oh, one last step. It's really that mad. It's really good. It shuts out one of these press and one of the way of the bio. Uh, thanks very much, Ken, for the invitation and the introduction. Um, happy to be here with everybody. Uh, and Ken hit it right on the nose with the goal here. Um, you know, everybody's uh, everybody's situation is a little different. Everybody's outlook on on the future is a little different uh, as far as these these topics come. But like Ken said, these things are coming whether we like it or not. Um, and what we want to do here is figure out how we can take advantage of the opportunities that are out there, take advantage of the funding that's out there. Uh, to make some upgrades in our buildings that can uh, set us up for the future while also trying to avoid some of the pitfalls uh, that are potentially out there. Uh, so that's that's going to be my main focus is talking about lessons learned from our experience having been through some of these projects. Um, I'll spend a little bit of time on... Uh, just do a... uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, sort of why this is such a, a hot topic in the last couple of years all of a sudden. Uh, I know people have been talking about climate change for um, you know, 10, 15, 20 years at this point, but it seems like all of a sudden in the last two years, things have really taken off. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about some of the technology that's out there just to sort of set a foundation. Um, but I'm sure a lot of folks have had you know, vendors come in, talk to you about their technology, uh, you've seen webinars, you've seen some other information that's out there. It's, there's a lot out there about the technology, so I won't get too deep into that, um, especially where we're a little behind schedule. Uh, where I'm mostly going to spend my time, uh, like I mentioned, is on the sort of lessons learned and, and uh, you know, things to watch out for. So uh, just briefly in terms of introduction, uh, this is the only, uh, the only time I'll spend here. Um, so just as a means of background, uh, Ken mentioned, we're, I'm with B2Q Associates, we're a mechanical engineering firm. So these uh, electrification projects are, uh, you know, a lot of what we're doing these days in terms of um, auditing buildings, studying buildings, and then actually putting together the plans and specs for, for designing them. So the question I mentioned to start with is where, where is this coming from? Why, why the past couple of years has thing, have things really accelerated? Um, and it really comes down to legislation at the state level. Uh, you don't have to read all the, the specific details, but basically starting in 2021, uh, we had Executive Order 594 from the governor, uh, Charlie Baker, that was pushing state buildings, you know, buildings that were managed by the governor's office uh, to move towards net zero emissions. So soon after that, we had the Global Warming Solutions Act, uh, which committed Massachusetts to net zero emissions by 2050. And then just in December of this past year, they passed the Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2050, which set uh, a reduction goal of 85% uh, for greenhouse gases uh, for the whole state. And uh, that takes into account increasing greenhouse gases for industrial and uh, manufacturing facilities. So everybody else has to reduce by even more. Um, and they set specific limitations by sector. So um, a lot of this is coming from the top um, and you know the it's sort of being foisted on a lot of people to have to deal with it. But uh, at the same time, there's a lot of, a lot of funding that's out there, um, both from the state and utility and federal um, levels that can help uh, help sort of ease the transition a little bit. Um, so again, I won't, I won't get too deep into the background here, but just for just for everybody's sort of uh, foundational understanding, when we're talking about why do we have to go to heat pumps um, if we're, if the goal is to uh, reduce natural get, or reduce CO two emissions, um, you know, don't doesn't electricity if switching from natural gas for your boiler versus electricity for a heat pump doesn't don't you have to emit CO two for electricity just as much uh, and uh, the answer is yes, as of right now, there is still a CO2 emissions associated with electricity generation, um, but it's not, not quite as, um, as, uh, as significant. So we'll take a look at that just for, just for foundational um, reasons, like I mentioned. So just for the example here, for a million BTUs of heat from natural gas, uh, you know, natural gas furnace might be 80% efficient, and there's how much CO2 uh, per unit of natural gas. Same thing for oil. An oil burner might be more efficient, but there's more CO2 per unit. Um, and we're talking about different units of measure here. So it's that's why I did the math out to make it try and make it apples to apples. 
So then uh, if we get away from fossil fuels and we look at electric resistance heat, like from an electric baseboard or um, electric reheat coil in a VAV box, that's 100% efficient. Um, but, and we've got lower CO2 per unit of kilowatt hour, but again, we're talking apples, uh, apples to oranges. So let's try and put it all in the same, in the same units. Um, and then just the last example here is with the heat pump, same, uh, same CO2 per unit of electricity, but we're now we're talking 300% efficient instead of 100% efficient. So put them all side by side with natural gas for that same million BTUs of heat that's provided. We're at 138 pounds of CO2. Fuel oil is worse. Electric resistance is worse, but not as bad as fuel oil. But heat pump is is twice as good as natural gas. So that's that's a lot of where this is coming from. Is you know even though electricity still has um, greenhouse gas emissions inherent in the process, it's a lot better in the near term, and in the longer term, as the grid becomes cleaner. Um, you know, more solar, more wind uh, comes on board, more energy storage, um, you know, uh, importing clean power from, from Canada, from their hydro plants. Uh, it's all gonna bring that, uh, that 0.633 you see here uh, that, we're, that is being emitted today. It's projected to go down to 0.41 by 2025. So that's a 30% reduction right off the bat. Um, and then by 2050, like I mentioned, the, the legislation uh, calls for it down, to be down to zero. So that's the, that's the plan. That's why in order to get, from, get to that uh, CO2 reduction goal, we gotta, the, the plan is to get to heat pumps first. And then once we're at, uh, get all the heat from heat pumps as much as possible, uh, then this, you know, as the electricity gets cleaner and cleaner, it'll bring the overall um, emissions for the state uh, further and further down. So uh, again, I didn't want to spend too much time on that, but just just to provide a little bit of background. Um, any questions there? Uh, so then I want, like I said, I want to talk a little bit about the the technology that's out there, the options um, to try to get get to heat pumps, get away from the fossil fuel heating. Um, the first one and the simplest that I'm sure everybody's familiar with is mini splits. I'm sure uh, many folks have them in their house already. Uh, there's a lot of rebates that are out there to get to mini splits that uh, mini splits and similar technology um, that many people are taking advantage of. Uh, so again, people are familiar with this. Um, it's relatively inexpensive because it's been around for a while and there's a lot of people that know how to install them. Um, so it's, uh, it's something that can be done quickly and easily. Uh, but when you start talking about, you know, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 square foot buildings, uh, it's a lot harder to manage, you know, 200 of these in a building as opposed to two or three in a in a house. So then the next step up from there would be something like a VRF technology, uh, variable refrigerant flow. This is where instead of having the one unit on the wall and the one outside, you've got multiple units inside, all served by that same outdoor unit. Uh, makes it a lot easier to scale up. Um, and again, there's there's a a longer history of of use of this technology in the in the in the market, so there's you know more people that are comfortable installing them. Uh, there's a pretty good competition among the manufacturers that makes the technology not too bad in terms of the uh, the cost itself. Um, and it's gotten gotten more robust over the years that they're able to keep maintaining um, output even at cold temperatures outside. And we'll talk about specifically how cold they can handle. So then. Uh, the, the options we just talked about, we would refer to as air to air heat pumps. So you're taking heat from the air outside and turning it into heat inside the building, uh, in the air inside the building. Um, a different way to do it uh, that is sort of similar to an air cooled chiller would be um, to take the heat from outside and put it into water uh, and distribute that hot water throughout the building. Um, it's better in that um, heat uh, water obviously and has an inherent um, better ability to transfer heat. And you can also potentially re, uh, reconnect it into your existing systems without having to uh, replace a whole bunch of infrastructure, it, you know, if things work out well, but we'll, we'll talk about um, the ways that that can be more or less likely to work out as uh, smoothly as you'd hope. Um, now that we're talking bigger equipment, uh, these types of units, generally, you're not going to be able to get a, 
um, a smaller uh, contractor to handle it. You're going to have to go with one of the bigger shops um, to, for somebody who can handle the amount of pipe fitting and, and uh, electrical and that sort of stuff that is required with these units. Um, so it makes, makes it an inherently more expensive project, unfortunately. Um, and we'll talk again that these units can operate down to low temperatures, but not, not all the way down. Uh, so often you have to have a, a natural gas backup, um, which is uh, both good and bad in certain ways. Um, so again, if we're we're looking at trying to distribute um, hot or cold water throughout a building, there's the air to water option where you've got um, got a condenser outside. The other option is geothermal. Um, so there's two different flavors of geothermal. The first one I'll talk about is um, sort of the centralized option where you've got a, you know, the equivalent of a chiller or a boiler that's being fed by the, um, by the geothermal uh, field. Um, and it's distributing hot and chilled water throughout the building. Um, you can get pretty good, um, pretty good coverage uh, with this type of system. You can get, you know, relatively warm water that makes it more likely to be able to work with your existing distribution if you've got hot water, um, but it's not a guarantee. Um, and because, you know, because we're talking geothermal, it's, it's going to be very, very expensive. Um, so, uh, you've got to potentially be drilling, you know, hundreds or, or more holes in the ground, uh, to put the pipe in for the geothermal field. And then on, that's an added cost on top of what you would have already been spending in the building for other options here. Uh, but the good thing is they, they can operate year round. You don't necessarily have to have that natural gas backup. Uh, but the other the other flavor of geothermal, rather than having that central chiller boiler that's distributing hot water, chill water, is you can distribute the geothermal water itself within the building, and then have a water source heat pump, you know, a one or two ton unit in every room. Um, that's often the most efficient option that's out there. Um, you don't have those limitations on not having a high enough temperature to be able to keep the room warm, um, and you've got much more flexibility in that each room has its own has its own system as opposed to being limited by the, the overall uh, central system. Uh, the challenge here is that, you know, rather than having one big chiller boiler in your, in your plant that needs to be maintained, now you've got 50 different compressors throughout every single room that need to be maintained. Um, so it's a, a more of a challenge there and, and is as, as expensive, if not more than the other geothermal option. So then uh, the last technology I'll mention um, sort of trying to get the best of both worlds between the geothermal and the non-geothermal options. So with geothermal, it's more efficient because the ground is warmer than the air outside. Um, so how can you replicate that warmer temperature to feed the, feed the heat pump without necessarily having to spend two or $3 million drilling, uh, drilling wells for your, your geothermal field? Well, you can use a second heat pump that can generate a little bit of heat and then it can be boosted by the other, the second heat pump. We would call that a cascade system. And again, it's, it's uh, more efficient. It's more likely to be able to keep up with the building load. Uh, but now you've got two piece, two heat pumps that you need to maintain. Uh, so twice the cost in terms of maintenance, electrical space, piping, et cetera. Um, but the efficiency, um, the efficiency difference we'll talk about is potentially enough to make it worth uh, exploring this option. All right. So uh, those are the different technologies that are out there. Again, happy to answer any questions along the way here, uh, but otherwise we can get into the meat, which is, you know, what are the what are the challenges and what can we do to try to mitigate them? Uh, so any questions? Okay. Um, so with specifically with the challenges here, I wanna share, share what we've been seeing from a, lessons learned perspective, but I want to emphasize that um, these, you know, these different challenges we'll talk about, they're not insurmountable. Um, none of these are necessarily out there to say that you shouldn't do a project or that, um, you know, the technology just doesn't work. Um, what we're trying to emphasize is that we want people to go in, go into these projects with their eyes wide open and be aware of um, what, you know, what could be things that come up along the way and how to, you know, how to anticipate them and, and make sure that they don't uh, don't derail your project. 
So the first one, uh, and probably not a surprise, is that a lot of these older buildings that we're talking about that were built, you know, 30, 50, 70 years ago, they just weren't designed to have uh, this much electricity coming into the building. Um, you know, the they may or may not have had some upgrades along over the years to add air conditioning. Uh, but even uh, even buildings that have some air conditioning are likely going to exceed what the capacity is of the electrical systems if you try to fully convert everything to heat pumps for the heating system. Um, so uh, this I put this first because this is probably the biggest challenge. Um, I think that uh, you know this is something that you want to anticipate early in the process. Uh, we'll talk about metering and ways to ways to know whether this is going to be a problem or not so that you can try and get the process started. Uh, but in many cases, a lot of these buildings are going to require uh, putting in an application to National Grid or Eversource or whoever your electric utility is to have them upgrade the service to the building. You know, new transformers, digging new trenches, putting in all new wiring to feed the building. Um, and it's going to be a, you know, a, an intensive process to get these buildings ready to support all the heat pumps. Uh, the second challenge, and um, in some cases, this is a bit of a surprise, is that um, the, the building becomes more efficient in terms of the greenhouse gas um, emissions that are associated with it, but your actual utility bills may go up uh, from year to year. And it's, you know, it's, it's primarily a function of what the market prices are for electricity and natural gas or whatever other fossil fuel you're using. Um, so it could change over time, uh, but most, you know, most uh, communities or, or, or owners are anticipating that they're gonna put all this capital into the building, make it more efficient, and they're gonna save money over time to recoup that investment. Um, and unfortunately, in a lot of cases, especially when you've got a, a newer building um, or a building that doesn't have air conditioning in the first place, uh, once you convert over to heat pumps, your, your actual energy cost on a year to year basis is going up. Um, so that's something that needs to be planned for. Um, obviously, there's there's funding that's out there to try to um, lessen the sting of it, uh, but definitely want people to come into this process with, again, eyes wide open that um, it may not be as uh, you know as straightforward of an economic proposal as as other upgrades to the building in in recent years. Um, Next one, a lot of people are are conscious of this already. Um, there's been a, a stigma over the years that heat pumps can't operate at cold temperatures, especially this part of the part of the country. Um, it used to be that for you know VRF systems or other types of units that once you got below 32 degrees outside, you had to shut them off um, because they couldn't you know couldn't generate heat anymore. Um, and the technology has improved pretty significantly um, in the past you know 10 to 15 years. Uh, most VRF systems, the condensers can operate down to minus 22 degrees outside, um, and they maintain full, you know, full output, full capacity down to minus 13, um, which is great. Uh, it's a lot better than it used to be, and that covers, you know, 99.9% .9 of the hours of the year in this area. Um, but it doesn't cover every single hour, and then you've got the the added challenge of, you know, what happens if the power goes out. Um, in most cases, the backup generators in your buildings are uh, have enough capacity for um, you know emergency lighting, um, so a fire pump if you have a fire pump, um, you know some basic uh, life safety stuff, and then maybe you've got the hot water pumps and the boiler on the on the generator, um, but that's you know a much smaller load than than what uh, what it would take to run a building worth of heat pumps or even a, a limited amount of the building on heat pumps uh, just to keep keep things from uh, you know going out of uh, going into an unsafe state. Um, so in many cases, as I mentioned, you want to keep that natural gas boiler or keep that oil boiler as a backup, uh, run it intermittently to keep it keep it fresh and available. Um, and in many cases that we talked about the increased energy costs associated with running heat pumps versus boilers, um, you, may, you may find that you have to switch over to the boiler when it's cold outside, even if the heat pump's capable of still running just to be able to you know, not, not uh, send your electric bill through the roof. Um, so that's a, it's a challenge that you've, 
you're often going to have to keep two systems in parallel to be able to keep your building reliably warm throughout the whole winter. Uh, along those same lines on cold weather operation, um, you know, this one is uh, sort of just something to be aware of. Um, when it's cold outside and you're heating the building from a heat pump, um, you're effectively air conditioning the outside air. Uh, so you're, you're making it colder around the unit, which can cause frost to build up on it. Um, and that's a maintenance concern, something you want to be aware of. They've, the units have um, built-in defrost controls, but uh, it's uh, not always perfect. And, and when that defrost goes into effect, the, the unit's not performing the way it otherwise could. Um, so you may have to you know, put in more capacity to anticipate that, um, that condition uh, or else have that alternative system you could switch over to if, if need be, if the heat pump's not keeping up. Um, so I mentioned earlier, um, the heat pumps are, are that produce hot water as opposed to hot air. Um, they often, a common struggle is that they can't produce as hot a water as a boiler can. So most boilers can put out anywhere from 180 to 200 degrees um, to you know heat the heat the building. Um, heat pumps, you know, in in the most standard configuration, can do like 100 or 120 degrees. Uh, so that big difference is it's not hard to see how that can uh, mean that you're having a hard time keeping your building warm uh, with that lower temperature. They do have. Um, a newer technology of heat pump that can make warmer than 120, it can do 140 to 150, uh, but you pay twice the cost for the unit and it's half as efficient. Um, so it's not always a, um, a no brainer that you would wanna go with that technology. Um, if you go with that cascade system or the geothermal, you can get even higher, uh, get to like 160, 170. So you're pretty much back to where you were and it makes it more likely you can just sort of plug and play it into your existing hot water system. Um, but that's not a guarantee. Um, and in every project, even if it looks like it should work fine, uh, the engineer's going to have to do the, do the numbers and see, you know, the, each coil, can it be reused, uh, each section of piping, does it have enough flow to handle the, handle the lower temperature, are the pumps big enough, et cetera. And there's, um, you know, in some cases you may have to end up ripping out a lot of your existing infrastructure to make it work. Uh, next one on ventilation. Um, so a lot of these older buildings, the ventilation is just provided by operable windows. Um, and it's that's still allowable by code if you have big enough and enough windows. But um, in many cases, uh, the if you start upgrading the HVAC pretty significantly, you're going to trigger a need to add ventilation, uh, which is going to mean putting new air handlers in the building. Um, you can do these energy recovery ventilators like I have here that are more efficient, uh, but even still you're talking, um, you know, a bunch of new air handlers, a bunch of new ductwork you need to fit into an existing building, um, new electrical demand. Uh, it's just makes projects more, more costly, more co uh, complex and more invasive. Um, so preheat, um, in most cases, uh, this is not not an issue, but when you've got um, systems that deliver more fresh air, more ventilation to try to keep, um, you know, you know, provide that ventilation we talked about, uh, keep people feeling healthy. Um, you run into the challenge where the the mix of, you know, zero degree air outside with the 70 degree air that's coming back. It could bring you below this 45 rule, 45 degree rule of thumb uh, is sort of the minimum that these systems want as the, the air coming into the, into the heating system, into the coil. Um, so if you fall below that, then the systems either don't work as well or are much less efficient, uh, can't keep up. So you might have to install a second heating coil um, or whether it be electric or hot water. Um, in some cases I mentioned here, the the manufacturer can provide you a unit that has gas that can provide a little bit of supplemental heat, uh, but then you're stuck on gas as opposed to trying to get to that full full electric option. Um, so, all right, uh, condensate. I'm sure everybody's familiar with these these little units here. Um, so when you've got a, a mini split or an indoor BRF unit, 
when it's in cooling mode, if the room is humid enough, it's going to generate condensate um, and it's going to pool in the bottom of this, this pump and then it's going to get pumped out uh, and needs to go somewhere. Um, so, uh, and a lot of the units have these built into them. You don't necessarily have to buy a second one. Um, so if you're on the outside of the building on the perimeter, um, you can just punch a hole through the wall and dump the condensate out that way. Um, but you know, not everybody's going to want to have 30 or 40 different holes in the outside of the building dripping water that could freeze. Um, so sometimes you're going to want to, uh, pump those to some sort of drain. Uh, and now you're talking about, you know, tubing and piping and stuff throughout your building. That's, that wasn't planned for, and you got to find a way to get it out. Um, so, uh, another thing to be aware of there. I think this is the last one I had on the challenges. Um, so there's a, a standard called ASHRAE 15. Um, it's part of the building codes. It basically has to do with refrigerant safety. Uh, the idea is that um, refrigerant is heavier than air. So if you had a leak and it got out into a, into a space where people were, the refrigerant would displace the oxygen. You know, the oxygen would rise to the top out of where people can breathe and you, people could, uh, could asphyxiate, could, could die. Um, so there are codes obviously to, to prevent that from happening. In larger systems, you'll have to have a whole uh, refrigerant leak detection system that people may, have, may be aware of from having chillers um, that's sensing that and has an exhaust emergency that can, um, can get rid of that uh, dangerous condition if it ever happens. Uh, but for a VRF system where you've got um, you know, condensers and, and, um, and indoor units in every classroom, um, if you've got a small enough classroom that the amount of refrigerant could fill the whole room, um, then you, you potentially run into a, a safety issue. The way you generally would fix that is you, you put these, uh, these uh, transfer grills in doors or in the walls. Uh, you could undercut the doors um, to try to pr provide some space for the refrigerant to get out into a different space so that there's enough, uh, enough free oxygen for people to, um, to escape safely. Uh, but again, it's, a, it's something that comes up on these projects that you wanna be aware of and try to, uh, try to mitigate before it becomes a, an issue. All right. Um, so again, I know there's there's a lot there. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and again, I don't want it to sound too pessimistic, but also don't want anybody going going into any of these projects, um, you know, unaware of these risks and uh, and uh, not you know not actively looking for solutions to prevent them from being a problem. So, any questions on any of those? Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's a great question. So the question was, you know, for a typical 100,000 square foot, say school or, or typical building, how much would the service size have to go up? Um, and it, it depends, obviously, it depends how old the building is, whether it was air conditioned in the first place, but um, we're seeing with pretty regular, pretty uh, consistent um, regularity that uh, if say you have a, a 100,000 square foot building, it might have an 800 amp service. Um, and there's, it's not unlikely you need to go up to 1200 or 1600 amps, uh, to support all this. So it could be 50% higher or double. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, right. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, again, in case anybody couldn't hear the question was whether that increasing capacity is going to have a corresponding increase in, in actual usage of electricity. And uh, and cost that goes along with that, and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, so you do get the benefit of your natural gas bill coming down, but your electric bill is definitely going to go up. And in many cases, like I said, the um, the net difference of that is net negative, net increase in cost as opposed to a net decrease in cost. So I just wanted to share. Uh, like just got a after funds, and it sounds like a great uh, project. Um, once we looked into it, we realized that we need to upgrade our electrical service. Right? Then we upgrade our electrical service plus the HVAC. It's not a trigger. And then uh, a fire pump and an elevator. 
So what we thought was we had a couple million dollars that we could spend on this project, push the project up to over six million dollars, which made the project the project on track. So even though there's some funds out there, um, there's still a lot of challenges, you know, surrounding upgrades. Yeah, absolutely. This I think one of the challenges, um, as explained with the with retrofitting building, um, I'm working on a building commission and we're building that zero tool front up. And in my opinion, grid's not ready. Yeah. That's a challenge. I've got a snow man pool that opened a year and a half ago. Net zero building. We pay for all of our we don't even have our meeting to tell me that they're on site. That's why I am getting but yeah, <laughs> and I don't know how long it's gonna be before they can be solved if they're even there. So I mean, it's been a year and a half for that building and um closing in on a year of the second one. And we're we're prepared. I mean, we covered everything in the world. We built a building for that reason. We spent much more money than it would cost to be built and building. Yep. And we're paying for yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, not to get too far off topic, but um, as as more of the grid is getting greener in terms of less emissions, more solar, more wind, um, that's more intermittent power, which makes the grid inherently less stable. Um, so that increases the the importance of having things like battery backups um, and also you know bigger, more reliable generators to cover you if there's ever a you know ever a blip. Yeah, please. Uh, right at the beginning, right at the beginning, you have a slide with that efficiency and uh, fossil fuel is similar to AD. Electricity is 100%. Yeah, it was a 300% slide. I, I'm wondering how you got that number. Yeah, no, good question. I, I specifically put it in those terms to try to, you know, make, make it uh, catch your attention. So um, with, with combustion, with fossil fuel burning, um, there's a, a limit on the efficiency um, because you're taking you're, you know, you're burning a fuel. So there's only so much energy in it that you can get out um, with heat pumps. It's a little different. So you're actually not creating the heat. You're moving it from outside the building to inside the building. Um, so you you're you're able to get a coefficient of performance. They call it you're, it's more than 100 percent efficient because you're you're not actually creating the heat. You're just moving it from one place to the other. Um, so heat pumps, like I said, they're they're over 100% efficient. For every unit of electricity you put in, you can move three times as much heat from one place to the other. So. Yes. Yep. Yeah, great question. Oh, 
But their philosophy is they're preparing to be ready for the greater race. So if you design a building now, maybe five years before they can be ready. But if you don't design a building now, are you going to come back and get the building five years before they can be ready? So they may know that they're not ready, but their long term plan is probably that it's not going to be a because we don't touch our building for 20 years. Once we build a renovate, we don't touch for a long time. So, are you five years ahead of the building? Mm -hmm. 10? Mm -hmm. We're not going to have a design that goes into the bigger buildings. So, that's some of the discussion we're seeing that it sucks that we have these new buildings that are ready and they're very strong. But the building is supposed to be five years. So, your building will be ready when the period is messed up. A long way, a lot of money. A long way. Yeah, that's a hard sell to, to propose a project that takes more returns. It has to be the right community. It has to be the right community. Right 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 Our license plans are relatively well used by Cambridge Ridge Society to talk about. I was just talking about the bigger politics today. Um, no one's here from the mayor. I'll pick on San Francisco budget mayor. Um, they have been discussing that. You know, do we install the old thermal weapon school because of the capital of it? I don't want to do that. And the culture that community half people want to have to go away and afford it. It's tough to have, so they chose not to get that for So those are the terms that we can think of here. It's somewhat more aggressive and more, and others are more risk averse. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to do. Um, I'll turn it back over because I know you're up against the clock. That first session was so dark and dismal. I'm so excited that we don't have to find you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I uh, I missed my goal then. If I I was hoping to you know balance the uh, the pessimism with with uh, caution, but um, it sort of is what it is. Um, so, uh, how much time do you, do you think I have left here? Uh, well, uh, we'll be here. We'll be here next time. Okay. All right. Yeah, I'll make it quick then. Um, so, on, as far as how to get ready, I think we, this can be the sort of the main um, piece to close out. Uh, as a lot of folks are talking about here, um, the goals that the the towns and the building owners are trying to achieve, um, there's there's a lot of diversity there. Um, like like Ken mentioned, some towns are 100% committed that you know this is what we need to do, uh, both to you know make the Make the town greener and um, and stay committed to the climate goals. Um, others take a more pragmatic and um, cautious approach. Um, so the the biggest thing I can uh, advise is before you start down this road, have those conversations internally and figure out what type what which category you fall into. Um, the worst thing you can do is start down the road of designing a net zero building and then scrap it halfway through, or vice versa, decide, design a a standard building and then you know decide how how do we fit heat pumps into this or get solar into this design and then it's potentially too late um so you want to have those conversations earlier i know they're not easy conversations to have when you're talking about facilities versus administration versus sustainability um, but they need to happen one way or the other so i would advise the sooner the better um the next one is uh, specifically with regard to that electrical capacity um for a lot of these projects, in order to know how much you would would need to increase the service, or if you need to increase the service, you need to have hard data around how much electricity you're actually using right now, um, and that's more than just looking at your monthly bills. Um, in some cases, if you have a bigger building, the utilities measuring how much electricity you're using every 15 minutes, uh, but that's not every building, um, and if you're not one of those. Uh, I would definitely advise um, working with an electrician and trying to get some meters installed, uh, you know, temporarily for like a month or so to get a get a sense of how much power you're actually drawing. Um, because if you're using a lot less than what the building could use, uh, then maybe you can make a case for not having to upgrade that service, which would be great. Um, so that having that information in place uh, gives you a lot of power as far as making a more informed decision on on the actual design. Um, Next one here, if you do have a building automation system, um, I would highly advise you to be storing 
historical data from that system um, for as long as you can. I know they don't always have unlimited capacity for storing data, uh, but as much as you can is all the better because again, you're making a more informed decision. Um, if you're worried about being able to maintain a warm enough temperature in certain parts of the building, or you're worried about how often um, you know your boiler needs to run at night, or um, uh, do you need both boilers over the winter or just one boiler, et cetera. Um, those are questions that people have anecdotal answers for and, and you can use rules of thumb and you can do calculations as an engineer, uh, but nothing's better than having real data to look at and say, you know, for sure we know this building can handle it because we see evidence that on this day at this time it was doing it or wasn't doing it. Um, so I would definitely advise having that historical data as best you can. Um, with respect to the ability of heat pumps to maintain higher or lower hot water temperatures. Um, again, we can do the calculations and tell you what we think would work, uh, but th like, there's nothing better than having hard data. So if you have a boiler that can handle it and can do uh, a reset down to a lower temperature, um, it could be worth trying it out for a couple hours on a cold day. And if you normally run it at 180, try it at 150 or 160 or even a little lower and see a, um, you know, how do you, are, is the building able to keep up? And if not, is it just certain certain spots of the building uh, or is it the whole building? So if it's just certain spots of the building, then the engineer can design, you know, increased capacity in certain areas and not necessarily have to compromise the overall system setup. Uh, so again, real data is, is the, the best way to make decisions. Um, and then the last one, so weatherization, I'm sure folks are hearing a lot of talk about weatherization, which would be things like insulation, air sealing, better windows, uh, better roofs, et cetera. Um, those are all helpful things in terms of reducing how much capacity of heat pumps you need to install, um, but they, they aren't exactly the best payback in a lot of cases. So uh, it's definitely worth exploring, definitely worth having the utilities send somebody out to do a free audit. Um, most cases they'll offer a free audit um, and tell you what your opportunities are. Uh, but I, you, you'll have to get, get the information for each building and decide whether it makes sense, what the, what the cost benefit is of, of uh, the cost to do the weatherization versus how much it saves you on the, on the heating system project. All right. uh, any questions on any of those? Yep. I just have a comment. Um, Absolutely. Okay. Um, so as far as funding opportunities, I, I can skip over these. I think you folks are pretty well familiar with the programs that are out there. Uh, Green Communities Act um, has that new $500,000 grant for these types of projects. Uh, utility incentives, again, you're probably aware of a lot of this stuff. Uh, anywhere from $2,500 to $4,500 a ton, depending on what type of technology you go with, uh, but it's limited to 150 tons, and then you have to go with the, uh, the uh, custom route. Um, the only one you may or may not have heard of is this deep energy retrofit uh, new thing from MassSave. So if you get enrolled in this program, you have to go through some steps to prove that you can get the savings. But basically, if you can reduce your CO2 emissions by 40%, you get a dollar a square foot adder on, adder on top of what you would have already gotten otherwise. Um, and if you have oil as opposed to natural gas, they'll, they'll throw a lot more money at you. Uh, the Renew America Schools, uh, again, I'm, I'm guessing you folks are pretty familiar with this. Uh, chapter 179D, the energy efficient commercial building um, deduction. Familiar with that? Worth spending any time on? So I think the statement of interest was due in January, but I think the um, official deadline is uh, end of April, I want to say. April 25th, maybe. All right, and I've got a couple of case studies, but we can um, we can wrap up if we're running a little behind on time. Okay, um, so there's a few projects that are actually um, moving forward that I can point to, and 
uh, tell you a little bit about where some of these lessons learned came from. Uh, so Natick Library, um, that project's in construction right now. They had an air-cooled chiller that was um, you know, on its last legs and we get a four compressors and maybe two of them were left running. Um, so we designed this one. We went with the air to water heat pump that can make chilled water or hot water. We put it, took out the air cool chiller, put the new heat pump in its same place, fit on the same steel, et cetera, on the roof. Um, and one uh, sort of advantage they had that not a lot of buildings are gonna have is that they had ice storage tanks in the basement uh, that were originally designed to let the chiller run at night as opposed to during the day when electricity was cheaper. Um, the rate structures changed a little bit, so they weren't making full use of it. But the nice thing with the heat pump is um, if you've got a heat pump that can make chilled water or hot water, but during the day you need both, you can use the ice storage to make chilled water at night and then make hot water during the day. And you can satisfy your building uh, all 24 hours, even though the, tech, the system itself isn't capable of doing it at any given time. Um, and then the, the thing I'll just point out here, if you look at this top line, and while well, you can read it. Uh, so here's an example of what the economics look like just for the heat pump itself. Um, so they were able to cut their natural gas by like 90% by going with the heat pump, uh, but they increased their electricity by almost double, um, by almost as much as they used in the first place uh, to, to use that heat pump because it's, it's that, that less efficient option. Um, but they were able to make the overall project work uh, because they did a lot of energy conservation work at the same time. So they upgraded their control system, they recommissioned and replaced a bunch of failing equipment, they added VFDs, um, they added occupancy sensors, things like that, that can help minimize how much energy the rest of the system is using, even if the, if the um, heat pump is, is using a lot more electricity than they were planning before. So, um, again, not an easy sell to have to do more projects on top of the heat pumps to try to make everything work. Um, but if you can do it, if you have the funds available and the resources to make it happen, it can help uh, make the net uh, impact on the building uh, much more palatable. Uh, Beverly Library, um, they're going geothermal. Uh, so we did a study for them to look at different, different technologies, uh, to give them some options of which way they wanted to go. So we looked at um, just replacing their existing rooftop units and air handlers and keeping the boilers. Um, and that was going to get them about $24,000 in savings. They could go with the air source heat pumps uh, instead of the boilers, and that would get them a little bit more savings. That would be 26000 It's that third row down. Uh, but they went with the geothermal. They went with that most efficient option that's going to have a bunch of different small compressors around the building. Uh, that was going to get the savings up to 91000 um, and you can see the payback all the way over to the left is the lowest. So that's the option they ended up going with, and they're in the process of designing that right now. Yeah. No question. Yeah. And that, that goes back to that first point about having those conversations internally going into the project before you get the results to know what your priorities are and what, what it's going to take to cross the, the hurdle to actually do the project. Um, because, you know, there's no sense uh, getting this great design or getting this great study that tells you geothermal is going to do X, Y, Z if, if it's never going to, going to pass muster. So um, I think it's, it's about, you know, having those our conversations up front and figuring out how how people can reach consensus about what type of project you want to do um, so that once you have the information it's easier to make a decision rather than having having it out at that point um, with some people trying to make the case for one view versus others who would prefer the first cost option so the 40 year payback is the life cycle of the equipment yeah great question um, so the the geothermal well fields will last that long. Uh, the actual pipes in the ground are supposed to last 50 to 60 years, if not longer. There's, yeah, exactly, yep. Uh, but the heat pumps themselves in the building are not necessarily gonna last that long. Those might be 20 years. So um, at, you know that that's a limitation of looking at things in terms of payback as opposed to life cycle costs, like Ken mentioned, where you wanna factor in that maintenance cost of having to replace 
you know, a certain number of units every year once you get to 10 to 20 years out. All right, um, and then the last one I'll just mention real quick, um, a smaller building, uh, they went with VRF as opposed to the, the uh, more expensive um, uh, hydronic systems. So this is this uh, training academy for the Rhode Island State Police. It's only a 10,000 square foot building. Uh, they needed 30 tons worth of VRF heat pumps. Um, but just for context here, um, they need they went with a new thousand amp service, whereas they had 400 before. So two and a half times as much electric electrical demand, um, electrical capacity for the building to be able to support it. You know that's partly driven by the heat pumps. Partly they had. Um, Domestic hot water and uh, cooking that was using propane, so the the thousand amps is meant to cover the those being electrified as well. But just for for context, you know, talk about a ten thousand square foot building that doesn't have anything too uh, too crazy in terms of equipment. They need a thousand amps, so that gives you some context what some of these other buildings might need. Uh, they will in the future. Yeah, the gener they're upgrading the generator as a phase two project. They haven't done it yet. So they're definitely at risk in the meantime until it gets done. This building also had a lot of asbestos, which I'm sure a lot of your buildings will come up, come up against. Um, so that's another thing to be aware of coming into it. Once you start drilling holes in walls and, and ripping out old systems, you might, might open up that can of worms as well. All right. So. That's it. Any other questions? Yeah. Some things never change. You know, the government's here to help. They really are. I ask them to get ready to take their seats. And the MSBA has a whole cohort of people up there just chatting. I don't know, Ed. What's the story? Oh, oh, he's done. He's done. He's moved on to the corned beef already. That's outstanding. Oh, this does work if you need it. Yeah. All right, we're going to get rolling, folks, um, so we can get back on track here. Um, thanks again. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Medic. See, I got I nailed the keg. <laughs> Medic and uh, Jerry from CC Technologies that come down today. We've had a lot of discussions and a lot of talk on our message board regarding security, regarding surveillance, card access, what's everyone using. Um, so being this technology is moving so fast, um, I reached out to CC Tech who's been doing a lot of public work in our schools to kind of give us an overview of what they're seeing, some of the best practices that it can apply uh, and some considerations. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, gentlemen. Morning. Everyone awake? Uh, I don't hear any cheers. <laughs> right. um, thanks, Ken, for having us here. Uh, I'm, I'm the owner of CC Technologies. We're based out of Avon, Mass. Uh, we've been in business since about 2005. Uh, we do do work with the state, uh, police department, fire department, schools, uh, town halls, you, you, any building you have, we've bas basically worked in. Uh, we also serve a lot of commercial customers. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts is our largest customer, for example. Uh, we cover New England, and we're going to present, pre present to you today some information about security. So I'm going to try to keep it not boring. I'm not going to get too technical. But if somebody here is technical, then just ask the question. Um, so we're, we're part of MFAA as, as a member or sponsor. Uh, we're also on the IT uh, on the ITC 71 contract for security. And we're working right now currently on getting on MHEC as a uh, provider for you guys. So I'm going to jump into it here. Uh, so just to give you, give you an idea of what we do, uh, we do fire alarm, burglar alarm services, installation, 
Uh, we do energy management, or you may call it building management controls and those things. Um, controlling and maintaining HVAC, monitoring energy, uh, video surveillance. We do a number of different brands. Uh, you've heard of a Vigilon, ExactQ, all these different brands we, we basically cover. Uh, access control. So whatever access control you might have, we, we've seen it, we've done it. Uh, solar and storage. So we, we get into providing solar services and battery storage if needed. Uh, and then for our other side of the business, we do drive through systems. So we we maintain all the drive through restaurants where you place your order to, to place your um, order at the drive through. And then a, a, another piece that's not on here right now is we are an energy supply broker. So we can resell to commercial or uh, school or city or state. And then uh, we do provide energy and security assessments. So if you needed to, like uh, someone mentioned earlier, uh, assess how much your building is using currently for power and what is what is using that power. We can install the meters to meter that for you for 30 days, 60 days to assess where that power is being being drawn. Um, we this is not security, but on that part, we've done 500 500 stores uh, Dunkin' Donuts, and they're saving uh, three to four million dollars a year with 500 stores with the energy management system installed. So security technologies, I kept the words out of this to keep it nice and quick. Um, so video surveillance, uh, you're all probably familiar with the old analog cameras versus the new IP cameras or high definition cameras. Um, the way we look at video surveillance is it helps you ID or identify the person or the vehicle. And then by having that, you can then track them throughout the school. So if you install the cameras, in a way where you create a, a corridor where everyone has to go through. For example, your main entrance of the school, you can pick up that car, you know what car came in and left with license plate recognition or at least get the make and model and color of that vehicle. Uh, and then you can track that vehicle throughout the property if you have cameras surrounding the property. Then when you get into personnel or students or staff, you do the same thing. You create portals where they're all required to go through and you have cameras and surveillance on those portals so that if you have a main front door and you have a side door where staff might come in, you have a camera that identifies every single person that comes in and out of the building. And then basically, again, if you then have cameras throughout the building, it doesn't matter that you can ID their face through the, through the rest of the building. You at least know that person that entered, they're wearing these this clothing and this is what they look like. You can still track them throughout the building. Then uh, on access control, access control, the biggest thing is locking down. So if you have a active shooter or an event, you want to have the ability to be able to push the button and lock the school down. Meaning that if you have a door that's on a schedule, that let's say the bus, the bus uh, dropping off the kids, the doors are open for 30 minutes on a schedule. If, a, if an event happened, you should have the ability to either press a, a panic button that, that someone's carrying uh, on the phone, press the press the lockdown button. You should have the ability to lock down the building in those incidents. Um, and access control, we'll jump into a couple of slides later, but there's many different ways to verify someone coming in. You have fingerprint, you have facial recognition, you have cards, you have uh, your, your key fobs on your keys, you have your, your cell phone with Bluetooth now. Some of these are new and some of them are old. Some of the older ones, we're finding that you can actually copy and duplicate those keys. I don't know if, if you've seen that or heard about that, but the older systems, even now today, some, some of these systems are still being installed. You can buy a $30 tool on Amazon and take a card that let's say someone here lost and take it, copy it, put it right back where, where it was left and then copy that information to a new card and then have access to that building as that person. That, that is a thing that's going on right now with, with uh, fraudulently uh, copying cards and getting into buildings. Um, the next item is perimeter. So the biggest issue is leaving doors open or ajar and not knowing how long they've been open, who opened them and why they open, right? Because that, that's your biggest vulner, vulnerability in, the, in these buildings. You have such a big building that I heard this is 400,000 square feet. Let's say you have 20 exterior doors here. 
How do you know if 19 of those are, are locked or, or not? You don't. So putting sensors, and you don't have to wire the sensors to the door, you can put wireless sensors at these doors and put a system in place that has a policy that says, if the door is open more than five minutes, more than two minutes, someone needs to get notified. If that someone is the front office, they get notified. If they don't act on it within a certain amount of time, you, you then have that system escalate to the next person. And then basically the third escalation is let's say the principal or whoever needs to get it to, to make action, to take action. So that, that's, the, that's the door ajar monitoring. It's one of the mo most important things that can be put in place. Um, shooter detection, basically detect where it happened and, and locate it, locate that person uh, if you have an sh uh, active shooter. So this, this is uh, a tool that the police can use. So if, if you have a system in place, your system is then sharing the information to the police department and potentially to their laptops and their vehicles so as they're coming here, they know that this person is on the second floor in the West Wing or on the first floor, first floor by the office. Uh, that can save time, save minutes, save, save, save lives. Uh, metal detectors, a lot of schools don't use them. They're an option. But then the other problem is you have to staff that. So somebody has to be sitting there and, and, and pushing people through. Again, it's just an option. It's just another layer of security. And in that case, it might be only used on events where you have a lot of strange people coming in. Not, sorry, not strange. <laughs> people that don't usually come to the school for, for an auditorium uh, meeting, like the town hall, let's say, people coming from the town, you might want to scan those people coming in because you don't know who they are. So that's, that's one of the options you have. Um, burglar alarm, mainly the, the panic buttons. If you can tie that to a panic button and have certain personnel in the building wearing a panic button or having a panic button at their desk scattered throughout the building, so you have at least a number of points that have the ability to call out to someone if for some reason they can't get to their cell phone or they can't run to a phone to make, make a call out. At least if you push that button, the burglar alarm system will push that message out with cellular communication. So in less than 30 seconds, that call is out to the police. Um, film or glass. So another item that is coming up slowly, but it should be coming up faster, is the ability to apply a film to your existing glass doors or windows, especially your perimeter doors, any, any of them that have you know a, a pane of glass inside them or the, or the full doors glass with the aluminum doors here, um, you know, I can take a hammer or, or a gun and smash through a door and be through the door within 10 to 30 seconds. With the film applied or, or the proper glass installed, especially on a new building, you can slow them down for minutes. They can't get through. They will kick, punch, they'll shoot through that glass or that film, and they, they'll be slowed down for several minutes, giving people time to run away or, or do what they need to do to protect themselves. Uh, so that, that's another key aspect here. Um, security assessments. I don't know how many schools have done security assessments, but uh, if, if, you don't, if you're not doing them, it's just a good way to educate. So if you haven't gone through and un understood what cameras can do, what access control can do, what perimeter door sensors can do, someone can come in here and assist with that and give you a report to say, you have 30 doors, 20 of them we found open or two of them we left we found open while we just walked around uh so the, just a basic security assessment to identify what you currently have and what you potentially should have as a recommendation uh and then and then work to, towards budgeting for that over a period of time and the last one is maintain maintenance maintenance uh once you put these systems in cameras fail doors fail hardware fails someone should be coming in here at least once a year and checking and testing all of the doors. If you have access control on, on perimeter doors, someone should be coming in here and verifying that you swipe the card, the door opens or it does not open and somebody's leaving that door ajar because they didn't feel like fixing it yet. Um, 
and, and also walking around to all the perimeter doors for access control, testing that when I open this door, it's actually showing me in the system that that sensor is working and that the battery hasn't died in that sensor over that, that year of time. Um, and just overall maintaining the system also will extend the life of it. So instead of having, you know, five or six things fail in a year or two, um, those failures can cause problems on the system on the back end in your IT room or your electrical room, where you might be shorting out a power supply and that power supply is just getting killed because of that bad strike, for example. Any questions up to there? So the next piece here is integration. Right now, at most schools, most people, most companies are used to having individual systems. You have your camera system, you have your access control, you have your Berg, you have your sensors, you have your thermostats, you have your monitoring sensors for temperature or energy. Everything is all a separate system, a different software, a different app. Integration means getting these things finally to connect to one interface, one dashboard. So you're not dealing with logging into five different systems, but logging into one. That is what's coming faster and faster down the road where you, you don't have to then manage all that. So everything's gonna be connected. And with access controls, uh, these are just some of the brands, but your access control can be tied to your access control, uh, to your video surveillance, I'm sorry. Um, your video surveillance. I don't know if you're familiar with the newer cameras, but instead of putting five or six cameras on, on, on one wall of the exterior of the building, you can get away with putting one camera to cover the entire length of, of a building and get a full picture of what's going on. What car has passed by, what car has moved, what person has come and gone. Again, this is not for identification of this person, it's for tracking that person that, that you've already identified at the gate or at the main entrance or at, at the front door. Then you have 180 degrees, you, you watch them from one end of the school to the other end of the school, and you never lose track of them or you never lose sight of them as they're passing by. Well, if you don't mind, uh, what yeah. we're finding is a lot of schools that you know, we go into, they're, they're asking us for you know, assessments and information on both the integration or where their blind spots are for their cameras and how that relates to their access control. So what we found is, as Big Merrick mentioned, a lot of disparate systems that don't work together and don't integrate together. Um, we've been able to go in and, and help others, you know, help a lot of school districts both integrate their different systems and then have their systems accessible both remotely and on site on a single plane of glass software so that they're not Oh, geez, you know, I've got a door jar, I've got an incident, and I'm trying to access my camera system, and I'm trying to access my access control system simultaneously, and, you know, facilities is calling IT, and there's a lot of confusion, and when there's an incident, that's when all this kind of comes to the forefront. So where we can help is to come in and, as Merrick mentioned, do an assessment to help locate blind spots, help locate doors that have been a problem, and then try to help integrate everything together so that facilities and IT can solve problems. Because as we all know, a lot of times things kind of go, just just go ignored until all of a sudden there's an incident and a parent you know, says, geez, my, my son or daughter was in a fight and we don't know what happened. We don't know where it happened. And then next thing you know, the superintendent is asking, you know, why don't we have a system that works? Why don't we have a system that integrates? Why don't we have a system that we can, you know, answer these questions to the parents? And that's where, you know, we've been able to come in and help. The, the, ne the next example here is inside the building. So the 180 covers your whole st street or access around the perimeter of the building. But inside your building, like Jerry just mentioned, uh, so, so a fight that breaks out. Mm -hmm. Right now, you might have most most locations we schools we see have individual pointed cameras that see 40 degree angles or 90 degree angles on the high end 
But what you're missing then is what's happening behind that 90 degrees that makes, makes up the 360. So we're in corridors where you have an intersection, two ways, four ways, you basically put up a camera in the center of that corridor, and now you can see the, the full action of what happened. Let's say the fight breaks out in the bathroom down the hall, but it moves down the hall and it goes around the corner. Sometimes you don't have that angle covered around the corner. This, this type of camera will allow you to have the ability to follow that person or, or that fight, or let's say it's a you know uh, active shooter. This helps you track a person from point to point without having to stop a camera, play the next camera, stop that camera, play the next video, or try to stitch video together. This is just basically giving you one image and it's giving you 360. If you can see that camera, it will see you. That's how you treat the 360. And then on the entrance and exits of the schools, there's usually not a lot of entrances or exits. If you, if you can put it into the system to have a license plate camera, then you can at least track who's in and out of this property on a daily basis. And it's not tracking who's in and out just to pick on them or ask why are you coming in late or why are you leaving early? It's to, again, if that person gets away, that active shooter, how do you track them down? If you have the plate number, you have just solved the, you just solved the mystery by 99% of the time. You just cut off 99% of the time to find that person. Um, we, for example, we're, we're in Avon. We're across the street from a Dunkin' and a Walmart. And we have license plate cameras on our property watching the street left and right, south and north. And on a weekly or every other week basis, the police department comes into our, our office and asks for a license plate. And we've solved uh, check fraud cases. We've solved uh, road rage where there was a gun, someone shooting someone in a car at, at, at an intersection, intersection down the street. Uh, there was a there was a murder down in Brockton, and then they happened to pass by our license plate camera. The license plate cameras can take a let's say a hundred hour case that would take detectives hundred hundred hours to track down things down to an hour because they have that plate, now it's just a matter of finding that vehicle. Instead of trying to find a blue Honda Accord, find one blue Honda Accord within a million of them. So license plate cameras do their job and, and, and it pays dividends. You, you can't even put a, a value on it. Uh, and and then there, is, there is a stigma around them that they're very expensive. There, there are $5,000 and $10,000 license plate cameras, but there's also $500, 500 to $1,000 license plate cameras. Those $5,000 to $10,000 cameras are for high speed. So you're talking 60, 70, 80 miles an hour to catch that plate. When you're, in a, when you're, when you're on a property, you're not averaging more than 20 to 30 on the high end if you're just racing out of here. Mm -hmm. So the lower end cameras, license plate cameras, are easily applicable, they cost really just as much as your other standard cameras, for example. And also most schools, I noticed in the folding years, there's really only one or two entrances and exits. Yeah. So it's not like you need, you know, 30 license plate cameras. If you just have your main entrances and exits protected with license plate cameras, then if there's an incident, you know, you're going to be able to go back and see who came in and who went out without having to have license plate cameras all over the city. So yep. it's not, you know, it's not that big of an expense or you don't have to, it's not like you have to replace the whole camera system. Most of them integrate with the systems you have and you really only need them at the main entrances and exits to keep track of who's coming and going. Uh, I've seen a lot of, you know, politics and litigation. Oh, we don't want, you know, we don't want cameras tracking our vehicles. And it's not, that's not really what, the goal is the goal is to keep everyone safe and to be able to, you know, go back and have a record of what vehicles came in and came out in the in the event of an incident. Really, you know, it's yeah. not like they're it's not like license plate cameras are there to track everyone. They're more there to protect everyone in the event of an incident. And they really only need to be again where you where you enter and exit the property. Yeah, and it's similar to the rest of the access control right. and, and video surveillance. No one is actually sitting there watching every camera 24-7 to see what's going on, what, what Joe Smith is doing right now. 
No one's sitting there watching who's using their card to enter what door. It's accountability later for if that hap that if an event happens, they have the ability to solve that problem or solve that case quickly instead of spending a lot of time and effort on it. So the, the, the next thing is more about integration. So you're integrating cameras, you're integrating access control together. You can also integrate door locks that are not wired. So if you have a school that has, let's say 10 doors, but it's impossible or cost prohibitive to run wire across the entire school, you can put it in a wireless system where your door lock is wireless and battery operated. It's, it's the same thing that you see at every hotel. Every hotel uses this system on a daily basis. It, it's, it costs them less to put in the battery powered wireless systems than to wire every one of those rooms. So you have that option to also integrate wireless locks uh, as well as elevator. So if you do a lockdown with your access control and you have a camera in your elevator, now you're tying cameras, access control, wireless door locks, and elevators. So if you did a lockdown and you don't want that elevator to go up or down, depending on where that incident or where that active shooter might be, you can control that elevator on and off. You can shut it off. You can say, don't allow to go from you know, first floor to second floor, but allow someone to escape if they have to come from the second floor to go out the first floor. So you can control those things with, with integration and having everything connected. Same old case of stairwells. I've been in a couple of school districts where either built a new school or did a renovation or had a project and the principals will tell us, yeah, they put cameras, you know, in the main entrance and the hallways by all the lockers. And a lot of the students know where there's no cameras and they've had a lot of incidents in the stairwell. So you have a stairwell that, you know, first floor, second floor, third floor. And some of the students are standing up on the third floor, they're dropping, you know, fruit or milk or whatever down on other students' heads. You only need a couple cameras, one one on the first floor, one on the one on the top of a stairwell. And that way, again, you're not it's not like you're watching seven by twenty-four. But you know, if a student reports an incident to the principal, then it goes back to the parent, the parents calling, gee, my son's getting harassed, he's getting things dropped on his head. At least you can go back and you can see what's going on. So that's where, you know, we've been called into a lot of school districts because we've, you know, been referred from other school districts where we've done projects and just done an assessment, help to help principals of schools understand where their blind spots are and, you know, just provide what's needed to fix it. And then I know there's budgeting and all that, but um, at least you can say we did what we needed to do to protect the students. So the next topic is re readers or how you get into schools or buildings. Uh, readers come in all different sizes and shapes and, and configurations. Uh, you have readers that can accept a wireless card read. You have readers that accept a pin code. Uh, you, you have readers that are a combination, reader and pin code. And you can turn on or off the requirement for dual authentication, meaning you have to swipe your card and you have to put your pin number in two layers to get into that door. Because again, pin, pin codes can be shared, cards can be handed out. But there's less likely that you have both going on at the same time. So if it applies, it applies, but the option is there. Uh, nowadays, you also have Bluetooth. So you can put credentials or, or access on your cell phone. So if you have Bluetooth on your cell phone, which... 99 or 100% phones do. You can use phones now instead of carrying cards around. Or you can use a phone as a backup. Uh, let's say the incident happens and the police needs to get in here. The police can have a number of their force, their staff, assigned to have Bluetooth access. And in a case of an incident, when, when a specific event is triggered, they're notified. The system can at that time turn on their credentials. So they work at that time. They don't have to be active 24-7, 365. There's ways you can set up the system where you can only allow them in that when you want them when an incident is happening. So the, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, ability to do that. Uh, biometric facial recognition is a thing now. 
it actually works. Uh, we're, we've, we've looked at a DOD project and this is how they get around in their facility. Their face is used to enter their different rooms in the building, their different offices. They don't use a card. They just use their face to get in, in and out of their buildings. Uh, there's encryption, there's not encrypted cards, meaning higher security or lower security. Uh, and then there's there's systems or readers that you put at the door that accept uh, multiple variations of cards. So if you have a thousand cards or hundred cards handed out already, and you're upgrading a system, you can migrate over from the old to the new, because some of these will allow you to use the old cards temporarily while you transition everyone over to the more secure cards. So there's systems that allow you to do that migration without being down for a number of days while you, you convert a system. And then this is the kind of the evolution of the cards or, or the security levels. Mm. Um, there's one here in particular, the 125 kilohertz. This card here is that majority of the, the ones that are being copied. Like again, buy a tool on Amazon, take your card out, copy, take a new card out blank, paste it. It's like literally copy and paste. And I have just copied your card and I can get to every door that you have access to. So this, this is what, what to be careful of is, and this is part of the assessment too. As an assessment is done, we verify what system you're using and are you, are you vulnerable with that possible mm -hmm. problem where somebody could copy your cards to get into your building. Mobile solutions, basically everything again, integrating into one platform, one pane of glass, like Jerry said, uh, getting you the ability on your phone, on your tablet, whatever you, you find is more, uh, works better for you, for your, your facility. Uh, again, you can have door access in that app. You can have the video cameras on that app. You can have temperature on that app. You can have energy on that app. Things are going to be integrated shortly where you'll see everything in one place. And then you can, you, you can assign certain people to have access to certain technologies or certain even certain cameras that you want them to see or you don't want them to see yeah there's a lot of uh, applications for obviously all of you know for the education uh for for the coaches for all the athletics the athletic directors it's been come up in a lot of school districts we need to give access to certain doors for you know football practice every sport after school so there's times of days where certain people need to have access to certain doors. And then you don't want everyone to have access, obviously, uh, during those times. So that's what's that's what's helpful for some of the really newer technology or just maybe upgrading what's in place now is you have that flexibility to be able to have, you know, your athletic directors, your coaches on a schedule so that you're not giving access too much access for too much time. Uh, it's, it's just been helpful for a lot of school districts we've worked with where, you know, they've had that problem that, oh, geez, how are we going to, how are we going to manage, you know, giving access to the coaches and to the students that need to come and go during those times of day. So um, things can be programmed and set up to accommodate that and migrate, even with an older system, potentially migrate to something that, that works for everyone. Yeah. And, and those, those events that happen after hours, like, somebody's renting out your gym or yeah. a sporting event after hours. What we see most of the time happening is the facilities person is usually not always there to maintain those doors, to maintain that they're locked or they're open. And right now the doors stay open the whole, the whole event. If it's a two hour game. The doors stay open, wide open for two hours. Everyone is in and out. Everyone potentially has access to the whole school. So you don't know what they're either bringing in or taking out in that time. Mm -hmm. Whereas with mobile access or remote access, facilities can have access to get a call from the, from the coach and the coach says, I need this door open right now so I can get in, leave it open for me for five minutes, 10 minutes. Then you have the ability to lock that door back down. Or if it is those kind of doors, make sure you install access control on those doors and make sure you have cameras watching who's coming in and out so that you have the ability to do accountability and accountability check later. So it's not the coach's fault that somebody walked in there. 
somebody, you know, a parent could have let three people in that nobody knows who they are. So it's just more control that you can have instead of just leaving doors open. Uh, one of the last things here is uh, dashboards. This is again, uh, getting things integrated where in the main office, in the facilities, uh, facilities office, or uh, anywhere you need to see this information, you can have a dashboard open at all times and see doors open. I can have my whole facility on a screen and tell me what perimeter door is open right now. So if it's the secretary in the, in the office or somebody in the front office that has this screen in front of them, they can see and have a red, red alert popping up that says, hey, this door has been open for 15 minutes. Somebody can act on that. That's on top of getting an, an alert sent out, sent out to someone to say, close that door, please. So you can watch uh, the cameras on there. You can have the, uh, activity on the doors. Uh, you can have temperature sensors. You can have HVAC sensors telling you that the heat is not working or the AC is not working in this area. All this kind of stuff can be put onto a dashboard, again, in facilities or office or anywhere else or mobile. Um, we talked about this earlier, the film or the glass. Again, if you're building a new facility, does it not make sense to at least cover the main perimeter, perimeter doors and maybe the office, the main office area to have that protection? Because that's the first line of defense. Your doors are the first place they try to get through and your main entrance. And if they do break into your main entrance, what are they going to go after next? The people that are in that office. And the people in the office need to be there to make the phone calls to get help there. So this is this is a simple thing to do. Um, Ken, I think you mentioned uh, you were working with uh, Armored One. Yeah. This is this is their their product here. Uh, I've researched their product. I've seen the videos that they have on, on the dem demonstration of how it works. It literally can slow them down for five ten minutes in some cases, depending if it's you know how it's applied and what kind of door it is. That five ten minutes. The police can be there within that time, you know, and that's that's what counts. Sa saving those seconds or the minute or minutes. Yeah. And if they do end up breaking through that first layer, again, if you can protect that office, that's their second layer. They're going to try to get there first to stop anyone from communicating. So those are the two main areas, that and the door perimeter doors. Open for questions. Yes. Go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, quick question on the card access that you showed before that the 125 pillar. Yes. Is that an RFID? Card, it, card. It, it's your HID white credit card size card, like your license card, size card. It's it, we're almost starting some sort of frequency. On the yes, card. yes, correct. Yep, and and it just comes down to the older cards are less secure and and more prone to be copied, and the newer cards are more secured. It's like your email or or your servers that they're they're encrypted, so it's not just. Your your ID number on your card is one two three four. It's not sending one two three four. It's sending a hundred zeros and ones. So no one's right. no one's going to decrypt that or, or or read that from it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's. it's we put in our badges. Yep. So we laminate that tab. Yep. Um, yes. It, so that is probably easily possible. Yes. Yep. <laughs> oh no. What, what is that? But 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 can you turn them back on? <laughs> no problem. Anyone else? Yeah, a lot of what we're seeing is facilities people and athletic directors and superintendents 
who want to have control of their access. So we have a we have a school district that we did a full system for their access control. And the person in charge of doors said, geez, I'm sitting home at seven o'clock at night and I get a call from the superintendent. I need to open a door. I need to close the door. I need to give access. And with you know the ability to be able to log in through VPNs now, it's added a lot of security and convenience for those school districts who have just taken the time and made the effort to do a little bit of research to see what do we have now? How can we improve it? And how can we make it more flexible for the staff? And that's really you know where a lot of school districts have been able to improve their situation by just having an assessment of what they have now and then what can they do to add a layer of security and add layers of convenience really for the staff really it's the staff that you know people have to get in their car and go to the school and unlock and unlock doors if there's an event or something in a you know in an auditorium like this say seven o'clock at night to nine o'clock at night it might not even be the school district it might be a town meeting and no one can get in or out and they they sometimes you don't find out until it's almost too late so that's where you know i know we've been able to help a lot of school districts and then you know as as you know you don't find out until there's an emergency or there's an event and people are jumping in their car and going to the school locking and unlocking doors where you know a lot of that could have been prevented Um, that we're seeing a lot of you know, newer designs mm -hmm. systems as opposed to communicating with each other. Like yeah. we talk, the heating system, yes, the yes, security system. And we keep hearing this that, oh, yeah, we're there, we're there, we're there. But once we roll it out, then we hit glitches, and then we hit the lighting system, that speak the same language as the heating system. Mm -hmm. And I know you touched on it briefly, yeah. that there could be temperature alarms in your system. Yes. Are you rolling out? Full integration of systems, or are you a shop that prefers systems standing alone? I hate I hate standalone systems. <laughs> I'll make that statement. Um, so, but I mentioned earlier, we do Dunkin' Donuts is one of our biggest customers. Uh, we installed 500, 500 locations uh, where, on the energy side of things, we gave them refrigeration control, so we we control the defrost cycle. We monitor the temperature of, of the of the refrigeration. We monitor the energy of the refrigeration. Uh, we control and manage the temperatures for the HVAC. We monitor the temperatures coming out of the supply duct. We monitor the energy of that H HVAC. Uh, we actually control their lighting with the astronomical clock, so you never have to have the, those dog legs pop out and change them. Uh, and we also control their, and, and monitor their appliances. So one example is their toaster. The, their toaster uses 4,000 watts when it's on to bake your bagel. We found that their employees, before they come into the building, uh, before they open the store, I'm sorry, uh, they come in roughly two hours before to prep the store to get ready. And then their policy is to turn the toaster off at noontime because the noontime is basically the rush and they have three different things that they can make bagels with. They were leaving the toaster on two hours after they, that noontime into the night, sometimes over 24 hours. That one toaster cost them $2,000 a year for those extra hours that it was on. So th those controls now turn that toaster off. Uh, then on those controls is the data that's collected is analyzed. So if you have an HVAC issue where you have two stages of heating or cooling, and we know that, let's say the one unit that has AC in the, in the dining area has two stages, each stage is using 5,000 watts, if we see that 5,000 watts is being pulled for AC, but the temperature in the ductwork is like hovering at 70, we can alert and say that the temperature is not coming out, but you're, you're spending the energy to do this. So those controls are, are, are that's all one system integrated. Uh, one, dashboard. one dashboard, correct. And you can add solar to that dashboard if you want or anything else. Any other questions? Um, I did want to share one quick story uh, just to share how I am. <laughs> um, one of my friends, uh, one of my friends just uh, invented an attachment to the design. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, that's 
So he can open his dungeon door by way of his hands. He can open his door by way of his hands. It's kind of like the thing is on. Um, that, I don't know if we can copy a prox card on him. I'm sure we could. Hey, but, um, that's where technology is going. I'm looking forward to it. I'm tired of that. Um, but when we're, we're getting to the point where you're starting to see some of this stuff. So this has been great and, and very helpful to see where we've come and where we're going. But be ready for any solving. Um, so Mary, Terry, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Thanks. Perfect. I want to take you to the final break. I want to